As unsettling as working the night shift at the prison was, there was one night when it became even more so. The kitchen was empty and dark, and I was by myself. During the off-peak hours, it was my duty as the guard to ensure that everything ran smoothly. What could possibly go wrong in a prison kitchen that is locked up? Let me explain. Like any other, my shift began. Every sound I made seemed to be reflected by the cold linoleum floor, and the fluorescent lights buzzed overhead. While checking the standard safety checkpoints, I was going about my business when I noticed something that instantly chilled me to the bone. On the stainless steel counter, there it was, a single knife, lying there plainly. A real knife, not one of those cheap plastic ones used for meal prep but one that is unbelievably sharp. It was not good, very awful. As you can see, at the conclusion of each prisoner's shift, all the sharp objects in the kitchen were meant to be locked up and counted, and it was assumed that the absence of one indicated that trouble might be planned, a weapon left ready for an attack on another. I looked at the one knife in the kitchen Everything else seemed spotless and organized, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. A chill went down my spine and goosebumps raced up my arms. This was unnerving on a whole new level. I was forced to take the knife and look into it. Every corner I looked at and every shadow I passed seemed to conceal some dark secret. At night, the prison had a way of making you question every sound, creak, whisper, whatever. I almost leaped out of my skin when my radio crackled to life with static. It was just the dispatcher, inquiring as to how things were going. I answered, attempting to sound composed even though my heart was racing like a drum. It would take some time, but the dispatcher promised to send another guard over. I kept looking, the beam from my flashlight piercing the shadows like a lifeline. With my senses sharpened to the point of pain, I made my way around the building, double-checking everything. Someone left that knife behind, and I had a feeling they might not be too far away. That's when I located him, in the faint light of my torch, hiding in the restroom, an inmate. My heart beat a little faster. Along with the knife, this guy was not where he should have been. He had to be the one to do it. Like a storm on the verge of breaking, I could feel the tension in the air. I cautiously stepped forward and called out to him. The prisoner turned slowly to look directly into my eyes. They had a crazy, frantic look on them that made my spine tingle. There was something dangerous and strange about him that I couldn't quite put my finger on. With the knife gleaming in his hand, he lunged towards me before I could respond. I felt a panic attack coming on, but then adrenaline started to flow. I ducked just in time, and he missed me by inches. The metallic clang of the knife striking the floor signaled the start of the fight and sent a chill through the sterile, cold prison. He ran as fast as he could toward the knife and got a hold of it. I had to get out of there quickly. I struggled with the insane prisoner as hard as I could. He was desperate and driven by a sinister purpose, but I was strong due to my survival instincts and training. We were both sweating and screaming during the brutal struggle in the poorly lit bathroom. Ultimately, I was able to overwhelm him, take the knife away from him, and cuff him. There was a tangible sense of relief, but it was soon overtaken by the realization of how dangerously close I had come to ruin. I conveyed the situation and requested backup via radio. I didn't feel secure enough to breathe until additional guards showed up. With my hands still shaking, I leaned against the chilly tile wall as the adrenaline crash struck me hard. Upon returning the detainee to his cell, he met it out one final evil glance and vowed to exact silent punishment. I will never forget that terrifying moment even after that night. In fact, the prisoner had planned to use that knife to hurt other people, and he had purposefully left it in the kitchen, waiting for a chance to attack, 
according to the investigation that followed. If not for my unanticipated discovery, the evil plan would have come to fruition. I learned a lot that night about the unpredictability of working the night shift in a prison. Not only are there physical threats that keep you up at night, but there's also the ongoing psychological burden of knowing that something evil could be hiding in the shadows at any time. My recollections of that prison kitchen would always be haunted by this terrifying tale of a night shift worked alone. Hey everyone, hopefully you liked the first story already. If so, be sure to leave a like and subscribe, and turn on the bell notifications. Thanks, you guys. At the hospital's recovery block, I used to work the graveyard shift. You know, the place where they keep the elderly people who have had orthopedic surgery. Most of these people required assistance to even get out of bed. It was an old, rickety place that was strangely quiet. But one boring night, things took a terrifying turn. I was trying to stay awake as I lounged in the break room at around 3 in the morning, drinking lukewarm coffee. I was dozing off and my eyelids felt like they were made of bricks when it happened. From one of the rooms, a movement signal was sent. I yawned my way to the door while rubbing my eyes and jolting to my feet. All of my attention was focused on an elderly man who had probably fallen out of bed. The patients were waiting just around the corner when I got to the room and opened the door. It was dark. An uncomfortable chill ran down my spine as my heart leaped into my throat. Particularly at this ungodly hour, these people had no business being outside. My entire being was shaken when I turned on the lights and saw what I did. Mrs. Anderson and Mr. Reynolds, two of the patients, charged at me like a pack of wolves. The once gentle and helpless glint in their eyes had changed to a disturbing malice. It was a look that gave me the chills. My heart was racing like a jackhammer as I stumbled back. Mrs. Anderson had this irrational strength despite typically being as frail as a whisper. Her skeletal fingers pierced my skin as she grabbed my arm. On the other hand, Mr. Reynolds was tearing through my uniform with his ragged nails as he clawed at me. I screamed, Help! But the only person who heard me was the night. The hallways were empty and seemed to go on forever because nobody was there. In an effort to free myself from their tight holds, I grappled with them. As I pushed them away desperately, adrenaline rushed through my body. The eyes of Mrs. Anderson were filled with a madness I couldn't understand as she let out a guttural growl. It was a chaotic, terrifying scene. They weren't acting like themselves, and I didn't want to hurt them. I was able to free myself after an energy surge, stumbling backwards. My thoughts were a jumble of uncertainty and terror. How the hell had they ended up there? I made my way back down the corridor while keeping an eye on the two insane patients. Something from a nightmare, that's how it felt. The only sound in the hospital was their rambling, insane mumbling. I had to call for assistance, but I dared not to take my eyes off them. The hallway lights started to flicker and get dimmer as I searched for my walkie-talkie. I made an urgent call for help as soon as the walkie-talkie started to crackle. Security guards and other staff members arrived at the scene quickly. Mrs. Anderson and Mr. Reynolds were able to be restrained after returning to their apparent frail states. They no longer had that menacing gleam in their eyes, and their helplessness was still apparent. My voice quivered as I described the terrifying encounter and spoke in a trembling manner. Both patients would be put under anesthesia and transferred to another location for observation, the medical staff decided. I couldn't help but wonder what had driven them to attack me and why they had suddenly become so hostile as they were being taken away. That evening, as my shift was coming to an end, I was overcome with a sense of dread. Previously, a place of healing, the hospital, had turned into a terrifying place. My hands were shaking as I signed out and left the office, 
hoping I wouldn't have to relive that terrifying experience. Working the night shift at a mental health facility is not an easy task. Both the stories and the hours seem to go on forever. Things like people entering high as a kite, babbling incoherently, and exhibiting extreme psychosis are what gives you the willies. In the shadowy corners of their rooms, you find patients huddled naked, having animated conversations with invisible shadows. In all of the confusion and hopelessness, though, one night sticks out as the pinnacle of my nighttime terrors. A male patient who had been a long-term resident of the facility was present. Hallucinations plagued him the entire time. He felt as though new fears would arise every day. That's why it was all too easy to write him off as experiencing yet another episode of hallucinogenic torment when he came charging out of his room one especially cold night, raving about a malevolent presence lurking outside his window. Nevertheless, we felt obligated to provide consolation and assurance, despite the strange and fantastical quality of his statements. So, our group of disorganized medical professionals armed with both compassion and skepticism met at the nurse's station and entered his poorly lit room. I took a deep breath as I walked up to the window, which was adorned with those detachable draw curtains. Glancing back at my fellow colleagues, I tentatively reached for the curtain and pulled it open, creating a suspenseful symphony with cracking rings. All we could hope for was the pitch black darkness, the shrieking wind, and maybe the soft sound of falling leaves. The patient watched my every move, his eyes wide with terror, but he screamed with a chill that went straight to my spine. My scream almost became a terrifying duet with him as I turned to tell him to calm down. Since my mind was incapable of comprehending what I saw beyond that window, there was a man, his back to the glass. His wide saucer-like eyes looked as though they were trying to eat the surrounding darkness. His features were wrapped into a twisted smile as he gazed at us with such intensity that it sent cold shivers down my spine. Something insane that gnawed at the deepest recesses of my consciousness was what I saw in his eyes. I was startled out of my reverie by the patient's scream, and I staggered back from the window, heart palpitating like an imprisoned animal. There was no reason to think that anyone would be outside that window. There was only the chilly night air outside the glass on our second floor apartment, with no ledge or balcony to speak of. The image of the man on the other side, his body and palms pressed against the window, was a nightmare come true. He just stared, not saying anything. I saw insanity in his eyes, then he ran off just as suddenly as he'd appeared. It was not a normal retreat, rather, it seemed as though he melted into the darkness, disappearing completely, leaving only our terrified expressions and a room full of screams. In a panic, our voices quivered with fear and our fingers trembling, we dialed 911. We knew we had to take immediate action, but panic had taken hold of us. Along with our building security team, the police showed up quickly. They looked everywhere, into the bushes, across the area, and into every crevice, but they turned up nothing. It seemed as though the man had vanished, leaving behind nothing but the eerie remnants of our fear. His screams served as a constant reminder of the unspeakable terror he had experienced, leaving the patients distraught. Though we did everything we could to console him, our own shock hung over us like a chilling mist. I couldn't help but think back on everything I'd seen and heard within these walls as the night had taken a sinister, surreal turn. That man was never seen by us again. The event was written off by some as the patient's deranged imagination or just another hallucination. However, the sensation persisted in my mind that there was something more, something much darker, 
hiding in the night's shadows. Ever since that night, every window in the building was transformed into a doorway into the unknown. A doorway into a world where the mysterious and the real danced in a ghostly waltz. When working night shifts, the fear of what was hidden in the shadows became a relentless companion that followed me everywhere. I couldn't help but wonder if the atrocities I'd seen were only the beginning and that the truly horrifying things were lurking in the shadows, waiting for their opportunity to strike.